Welcome to today's special edition of the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation After Action Review. My name is Joe Minogue. I'm a retired lieutenant with the FDNY. And I currently act as the FDNY liaison for the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. Today, we're gonna to be talking about the life and the tragic loss, the line of duty death of Carmelo Carmine Puccia. To frame the time, the mayor of New York City was Mayor Lindsay. The fire commissioner was Mr. Lowry. And the chief of the department was John O'Hagan. With me today uh, for the segment uh, is the Puccia family and also NFFF director of programs, fire service programs, John Tippett. John, can you give us some, some thoughts on why we're here today and a little insight on what we're doing? Sure. Uh, first of all, thanks very much to the Pachia family for coming out and uh, helping share the story of the life of, of Carmine. Um, we're very excited to have you here and uh, very grateful for your time. The, uh, the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation was created by Congress to help families of the fallen and also um, remember firefighters who die in the line of duty. And in an extended version, also provide training to firefighters so that we can prevent as many of the preventable line of duty deaths in the future. And your meeting with us today is a significant contribution to fulfilling that mission. So we can't say thank you enough. Thank you, John. Thank you very much. And now, if you don't mind, introduce yourselves, and I'll, I'll start with you, Mom. My name is Jane, and I'm happy to be here today number one, uh, to share my husband's life, but to tell you a little bit about myself also, that I was born in Brooklyn, and so my husband was born in Manhattan, but we met in Brooklyn. So that Brooklyn is a good part for us, and uh, after we got married, um, we settled in Brooklyn, and, uh, and I, was a, I worked for the Navy for three years, and then after that, I was a secretary at a Catholic school in, on Staten Island, so uh, that's part of my life. And uh, I have two beautiful daughters that I'm very proud of. Mm -hmm. Well, I, I thank you for being here, you know. Um, and I know this journey about the, the uh, dedication to this building started a long time ago. So to, to have you here, and I don't wanna say end cap it, but kind of add to that story is, I think is, is a, a gift that we're gonna be giving to everybody, not just here in the FDNY, but around the country or whoever else wants to listen to it. So I, I appreciate the three of you being here and your families for supporting, you know, your efforts to be here. So, so, so thanks a lot. You're welcome. So, so now I'm going to ask you the question. How did you meet? Oh. <laughs> How did you meet Carmelo? And did you know him when you first met him as Carmelo or as Carmine? Carmine. That's how you first That's him. how he introduced himself to me. Um, my, I'll tell you a little bit about my father. He would always work um, his vacation so that my mother could take us down to Coney Island and do day trips. So she would always take us to Coney Island and my father would work and we would record things at, at the, the little arcades telling daddy we miss you and all this stuff. But he was a great uh father and uh, so he gave that to my mother and we didn't drive, nobody in my family drove. So it was always taking the, the bus, taking the train down to Coney Island. So, and I never went in the water because somebody pulled me under once. So I, everybody always used to go in the water and I would stay with the blanket. And uh, Carmine was at the beach at the same time and he was on vacation and he was sitting a blanket over. So he happened to walk over to me and I said, hmm, he's kind of cute, yeah. So my mother, so he started talking to me and uh, we drew up a conversation and everything. And then my mother saw that he was at our blanket and she got very upset over that because don't forget I was 16 when I met him and he was 21. So there was a big difference then, but she didn't know that at that time. Uh, so anyway, um, he asked me for my phone number and I gave him to him, which was a, Usually you don't do that, right? So, but I did it for some reason. I just was really, I knew I liked him. There was something special about him. He was gentle. He was 
you know, very, very good looking too. I guess that had a play part. <laughs> <laughs> the attraction was definitely there. <laughs> definitely there. And I, and so anyway, so my mother saw that he was sitting at the blanket and she rushed right up and she said, uh, then he introduced himself to her and then he left and he went on his blanket. So then he had said to me, um, before that, that, you know, cause I, he said, do you drive? Did you drive here? I said, no, we took the train. And so then, um, my mother, he said, I'll, I'll drive you, you know, your whole family home. And my mother said to him, uh, no, how would that look for your father? Your father would not appreciate us coming home in the strangest car. So anyway, <laughs> so anyway, he, he, we left and I thought he took my phone number every day for three months. He called. My mother would not let me go out with him or my father. Every day he would call and say, did, did they say we can go out? Did they say we can go out? And it was maybe three months before. And then he, then finally my mother says, after I got all his information, who he lived with, how many sisters does he have, where does he work, and all of this. So anyway, she finally let me go out with him. So that was the beginning of our relationship. And um, he taught my... Uh, he was just a great guy. My mother fell in love with him. My grandma, everybody fell in love with him. My sister. He was just, and he loved cars. He loved convertibles. Convertibles? Convertibles. He had a, yeah, uh, he had a 1959 Cadillac convertible, baby blue. Oh, wow. And he also had a red Chevy uh, car uh, mm -hmm. convertible also. So for us, we never had cars. My father didn't drive, my mother didn't drive. And he taught my brother how to drive. So he was the first one to drive in our family. So uh, that was the part of my life where we met him. And from there, everything was just perfect. We got engaged when I was um, 19. And uh, we got married when I was 20. Uh, we lived in uh, three rooms for six years. Uh, Shortly after we got married, he lost his job, um, and uh, that's what made him decide to uh, take the fireman's test. But he was never without a job, and I became pregnant, and uh, I thought, uh, and he told, don't worry, you'll be fine. I'll always have a job, and he always was a provider. And then he said to me, um, it, and he said to me, uh, we, we will get by. And, and at that time, women were not allowed to work if they started to show. So after four months, I had to leave my job. And I worked for the Navy at that time. So I left my job, but he had many jobs in between. And uh, my brother at that time got very sick with cancer. And uh, he was uh, only 23 uh, years old. And Carmine would take my brother all the time uh, to the doctors, get chemo and uh, all of that uh, to take care of uh, my brother. He just was a, a given person and had so much love and he just gave constantly to whoever needed that love. So we, we decided, we stayed in our house, we bought a house in, uh, we, we, we were in three rooms, we bought a house in Staten Island. Um, August 31st, my brother died we moved into my, and September 16th, uh, September 14th, my father-in-law died. And we moved into our house November 20th on Staten Island. I had no phone, no nothing in 19, uh, 1969. Um, and, um, and that's uh, no phone until he died. That's when they finally put the phone in after all of those months, at six weeks or months, that's when they put the phone in. But I had a dream before, he, before I got married, not while I was married, and he became a firefighter. I had a dream that men would come to, came to my house to tell me that he had died. And I never put the TV on uh, to watch the news at that time. So then shortly after that, that's exactly how it happened. The house that I never knew was mine was in that dream. And, uh, and that's how they came. They came because they had no phone. So they came and rang the doorbell. And uh, that's when they told me about the tragic death of my husband. And that's when I felt that I, uh, 
the wind was knocked out of me at 26. And then not only did I realize uh, how difficult it was for me, but how difficult it was for his children. God has been so good, and uh, my greatest gift was my children, as I see. He lives in them, and he continues to live. And uh, we keep him alive. Never forgot, never kept him alive all these years, as if he was still with us. In our conversations earlier, I could see that in all three of you, you know, that he still lives, you know. We don't, uh, we don't just stop loving somebody, you know, you just continue loving them. And I could see that in, in all of your faces and every word that you, you shared with us. I can remember looking out the window and seeing four men in black overcoats. And I turned to my mom to tell her that there was four men with black coats on. And she literally like fell to her knees. I could still see her falling to her knees, not even understanding what was going on, because that was all that was said to her. She knew. Yeah, that'd be that'd be tough. I don't I don't care what age you are. What about you, Isabel? What do you remember? I was five. I I do remember um, my mother sitting on the couch, um, and then the knock at the door, and two. I I only remember two men coming to the door dressed in black, and uh, they they came in, and my mother screeched and dropped to the floor, and um, I don't remember much after that except. I felt like we were shuffled upstairs to the bedrooms with, um, with I've, well, I know who it is now, my, uh, my, uh, my stepdad, uh, the priest that came to the, um, the house. And he sat with Janie and I um, upstairs. Um, and I remember it was a lot of boxes around the house because we had just moved there. Um, so there was a lot of change going on and then this trauma, you know, that happened, um, to us. Um, but, um, yeah, it was, it was just scary. It was scary. It was scary. Yeah. Jane, who did you reach out to after, after the shock of the notification? I couldn't even reach out to my mother and father because I had no phone. Right. Okay. So... I had to go to a neighbor's house that was down, and, and my mother and father didn't drive. So then they live in Brooklyn, and they had to get to me. So I felt very alone, moving from Brooklyn, moving from my family, and then moving to Staten Island. But this was like our dream house, and, and we thought, well, you know, this is where God wants us to be now. And, and I remember making sure that I, that I, I could walk to a church. So there was a church always in walking distance because my mother always said to make sure you buy a church. And, um, but I reached out, to, uh, I got, went to a neighbor's house. Uh, some, I, it was so confusing that day that someone stayed with my daughters while I went to a neighbor's house to call my mom, uh, to tell her that, uh, that Carmine had passed. So uh, she, she said, I'll try to get somebody to take us over as soon as I could get there, Jane. So, um, so that's what she did. She got there as fast as she could, which wasn't very fast. And uh, so, uh, and I, it was really, I, we really felt alone. You were alone. We were alone. It was heartbreaking. Um, Everybody had left, and then we were there waiting for my mom to come. Um, no one ever took us to uh, see my husband. Uh, he left that, that day. Isabel got off the bus. She waved to her father at the bus stop. Janie was with me. She waved, and I walked to the house, and he got on his bus after she got off the bus. So, and then... I was only 26. Somebody should have taken me to see him. But at, I didn't know the extent that he got hit with a train. So uh, and then that was, that was a very difficult time for me to go through. 
And uh, so then my mother and father came and they, they were excellent for me. They really, they were there a lot uh, the whole time. I don't know what I would do without my mom and dad. Uh, they, were, they were very special. But then, uh, and then back in those days, you didn't take your children to funerals. That was another heartbreak for my daughters. Their father was gone and they didn't... No closure. No closure for them. Mm -hmm. uh, and then you think... They didn't and then, even understand uh, no, what that was at that time. No, you know, nobody. Like, we, only my brother was, had just died. So I was grieving the death of my brother of, after for four months. And then my husband died. And uh, my mother had to go through that also. And then my daughters went through because they were so close to my brother also. So uh, it just was heartbreaking. And then they take you into the funeral home. And I'm with my father and his best friend, Tom, who was a firefighter. Uh, I couldn't even walk up to the casket because it didn't look like my, uh, my husband. So I, I said to my father said, what do you want me to do, Jane? I said, Daddy, you go. You tell me what I should do. So my father went, and uh, he came back, and he says, Jane, you have to close the casket. So we closed the casket. So, and it was difficult. And I'm seeing here, I'm grieving, but my daughters are grieving. They're so much younger than I am. How did they get through this? How did they get through this? And they had no, um, nobody. I didn't know anybody that was a widow at that time, at 26. They didn't know anybody who, who didn't have a father at four and five. So it, it was a hard time and there was no help out there for us. No help where you can go and talk to somebody, a grief, to grieve and, and get it off your chest. So there wasn't anything. So my whole thing is my faith. I tell you, my God got us through everything. He really did. And he's still with us. And I, and I instill that in my daughters. Because that's how we felt even when we got married. It took three to get married. It takes God, the center, and you and your husband. Uh, and it's just the way it is. I think it was a perfect segue to um, you were sharing with me earlier uh, that you, know, you met on the beach, you shared it with us. Mm -hmm. um, but tell me about um, how we asked you to be man and wife. How, how, would, how did that happen? That was, uh, he asked me, he said, let's, take, let's go visit church. So I said, okay, I'm, I was, because I was always in church. We went to Mass daily. So I know I love to go to church. So uh, it went, we went into church and we sat in the back pew. And then he says, Jane, do you think it's time that you would marry me? And I was like, what? Of course I would. What a perfect. You think it's time. What a, what a perfect place, <laughs> church. <laughs> he couldn't have picked a better place to get marry me. <laughs> you know, to, to engage me to get married. Yeah, spirituality yeah. In, in all our conversations seems to be centered on all your mm -hmm. lives. It is. You know. And then when you got married, there was a dove in the church. Yes. When you got married, there was a dove. A year later, I got married, and uh, my sister was the maid of honor, and she said to me, did you see that dove flying around your, your in Carmine's head? She says, I says, I did. That was the Holy Spirit, I said. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love it. So when did you find out that his name was really Carmelo? Oh, he told me right away. <laughs> he did tell you right away. <laughs> yeah. So how did Carmine, how did that come Well, up? Carmelo is, is an Italian name, and his parents were from Italy, so uh, Sicily and Italy. So um, he said, he, he, he tried all different names. He said, maybe I should be called Carl. Maybe I should be, <laughs> but, he, but he finally stayed with Carmine. He said, because that's the closest to Carmella was Carmine, I guess. That's the American May. Of, so, so everybody in the, in the New York City Fire Department knew him as Carmine? Or? Yeah, I think so. The American, <laughs> the American way to say yeah, Carmella. I mean, yeah. The American yeah. version. Yeah, the yeah. American yeah. version is Carmine. Yeah. Yeah. So uh, what jobs did he have before he became a, a New York City firefighter? He was an aircraft mechanic for Republic Aviation out oh, in Long right, Island. Right. 
Okay, and that's the job that uh, shortly after we got married, he got laid off from. So he was looking to get another aircraft mechanic. So he had his name into all the air, you know, the um, Pan American, American, whatever airlines was out there to see if he can get a job. Nothing right came through right away. So uh, he he was a New York City cab driver. Uh, he drove the uh, UPS. And they would deliver packages uh, till midnight. <laughs> I wouldn't wait till he came home. And then, uh, meanwhile, he just take the fireman's test. And then, then he got a job um, uh, working for Pan American as an aircraft mechanic. And he was happy. But then the fire department called. And he said to me, Jane, I think I'm going to try for the physical. And he, I, I says, okay, uh, if you, that's what you want, uh, you could try for it. Uh, so, but he wasn't that tall. <laughs> he was like a half an inch too short. <laughs> so he would sleep on a, a board, a door, anywhere on the floor, just to grow that air, you know, when he was going for the physical. And he finally, he made it five foot eight. So he, that was good. He was happy. So he said he took this job because he wanted uh, security in case something happened to him. Yeah, yeah. Mm -hmm. I think uh, I read somewhere that he was a naval reservist yes. as well. Yes, yeah. yes, and, he was. And he delivered diapers somewhere? He did deliver diapers. <laughs> he did the live diapers. That was one of his other jobs. He delivered diapers. I told you, he would not, he always made sure he had a paycheck. <laughs> one job to another, one job to another. If, if they laid him off, he would get another job. I think that speaks volumes of who he is as a person, you know, and the legacy that he, he gave to, to you, the three of you, you know? Oh, they, they have so much of his qualities in, in them. He, he's, he, he's, he was gentle, loving, caring, would do anything for anybody, any, any, anybody. And my daughters are the same way. They both would do anything. We all are that way. We just, because God gave us those gifts, and, and if you, you don't use that gift of love, you can't give. True, true. You can't give. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure when he was in appropriate school, he had that same drive, you know, and that same gift to help everybody else out. Can you tell me something about what you remember about him going through appropriate school? Probably school, uh, probably school was, uh, he would go through probably school, okay. But we would be waiting all the time for him to come home. Yeah. And we lived in Brooklyn. As I said, three rooms. We, we made the sacrifice. But he would, he, one of his friends would go back and forth with each other. And uh, they would, um, he had some nice stories, I guess he told. Uh, we wanted him to give up smoking, but he wouldn't give that up. <laughs> Why should I? As I look at my handkerchief, it comes back back. <laughs> so he didn't give that up anyway. Yeah, tell me about that. When he when he first went to Engine Fifty Three, what was what was the feeling for you, for you, and you know what you remember? Well, uh, as I said, I, I would never put on the news when he was at work. And there was no cell phones that he could say, Jane, I love you. It had to be when he left in the morning <laughs> or when he came back and gave us a kiss or, you know, whatever. But uh, every time he was on, on a shift, I would, my girls would be up and he was coming off a night shift. I would be, be waiting at the window for him. And I would say, in Brooklyn, they had alternate side street parking. So we would look at the window and say, let's see how many times dad, he goes around the corner. <laughs> <laughs> And then we were like, so, there he goes. There he goes, <laughs> one. <laughs> and again, here he is. <laughs> so uh, it was quite a few times, but that's, every time that was out what we did, we waited by the window. Made a big deal about I made a big deal when he was coming home because I was so happy, be home for happy to see him. Yeah. yeah, I just mm -hmm. thought we, he was such a family man, so loving and caring, as I said, yeah. We were so in love, <sighs> so in love. Clearly evident. Yeah. Yeah. Very much clearly evident. Yeah. 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 And it continues. I mean, you can see that it continues in all of you, even through your pain. It's, there, you're, it's, it's still there to, to, yeah. to have those, those happy memories of, of what, what you've experienced to carry you through some of the, the hard times. Yeah. So I know the girls were young, but you know, some of the memories that you may 
have or some of the things you might remember? I mean, we have a lot of folks in our audience that are also going through this. They, you know, they don't have the years and years of things that you have had to go through. So what kind of things do you, would you like to share or could you share with? I can remember one moment that sticks in my mind when I was a kid um, is when we were in the city and we were driving in my dad's car and I was four, so red light, green light was like a huge thing to me, you know, and my dad was stopping at the um, green light, you know, we, you know, horns were honking, and I'm like, it's green light, go, go, red means stop, green is go, like, I, you know, I remember saying that over and over, and, you know, horns were honking, and my dad just got, ignored me, you know, just got out of the car, and held up traffic, and all we could see was him crossing this old lady, with a cane who could not cross the intersection. And that sticks in my mind. That's a nice memory. And I, I, I say I think that is why I work in the field that I work in, because I work with people with disabilities. And I just wanted to be just like my dad my whole life. And um, I just want to give back to people in the community. And that lady with a cane really stuck through my, you know, that's just the person my dad was. Like he would help anybody, do anything for anybody. He was just, you know, his hugs were genuine and just. Big hugs, yeah. Throw it, you know, yeah, big hugs, you know, and everything was perfect. He was perfect. He was too perfect for this earth. That's God wanted him. I, yeah, like God had a purpose for him, you know. Yeah. And um, he knew we would be survivors, so uh, as long as we have God in our life, we are survivors. Yeah. What do you Isabel? think, Isabel? Uh, one of my memories uh, of my dad was um, when I was in kindergarten, and um, he was coming to pick me up in his car, and... Um, and I was running, it was, it was Christmas time, and I was, we had just moved to Staten Island, so um, I was running to the car to get to him, and so excited because I had just made an ashtray uh, for him out of clay. <laughs> and I was so excited, but I fell. And it broke. And uh, that was one of the hardest things when he died because he said when I can remember him saying, oh, don't worry, you could make me another one. And um, I think when he died, for me, it was like, well, how am I not going to be able to make a, an ashtray for him? Um, and I carried that through my whole life uh, for, well, for a while until I had um, my second child and um, she died. Uh, at two months old, and in the hospital, I, um, it, I, I don't know how or why I connected the two things, but, uh, but I, you know, you, you, when you grieve as a child, it's different. You have different things that come up in your mind, but um, it was like, Dad, here, this is my gift to you. Take care of her up there. So he's got one of his grandchildren up with him. Yeah. yeah, the spiritual uh, connection in, in everything that we've talked about so far, whether we're on camera or before, is yeah. something spiritual. And I do believe he's he's here. Oh, he's, I do. He's there. He's that. I, I do. He's that star every night that I look up and I see, and he is the brightest one. <laughs> <laughs> he's really bright. <laughs> he's there. He is. Yeah. Very much so. So I'm, I'm going to start, I think I'll start with you, Jane, and then I'll, I'll go to you and then I'll go to mom. Mm -hmm. All right. So if I were to say, what's the one memory of him that puts the biggest smile on your face? And, you know, if you want to, you know, join it together and put it together, mm -hmm. that's, that's great, you know? And, you know. Well, for me... I was really daddy's little girl. I just followed him all over the place. And he was always very handy um, 
he was a jack of all trades and he was always in the basement like fixing things and you know want to make the house better and and like he was a superhero to me you know and I can remember just staring at him you know and watching him hammer and stuff and and then I was always right by his side so he wound up giving me a little ball peen hammer kind of set me up so I kind of would get a, you know, give him a little break because he was trying to work. But I would, I could remember just staring at him and staring at him because he just was so, he was, he was the best, you know, and just, I just admired him and just followed him all over the place. Yeah. We were just a loving family. Yeah. We really were. Yeah. <laughs> and Isabel, you have a, a, a big smile for you. <laughs> Yeah, I, I remember sitting in the car, uh, his cars, he loved cars. <laughs> so I remember sitting in the back seat and I, they always had humps in the, in the car. Yeah. And I remember always sitting on the hump in the back while he was driving and having a good time. <laughs> and no seatbelts then. Yeah, no, no seatbelts, no, no, no. So I, uh, you know, car rides with him, because he loved cars, was to me a fun adventure. And that's what I, I, I remember um, having fun with him. <laughs> yeah, so the car rides, were they yeah. um, just around Brooklyn, Staten Island? Or were you, would you go other places? Oh, we went all over with the car. Brooklyn, we had, because, you know, my grandparents still lived in Brooklyn at the time, so it was nice because, like my mom said, my dad was the only one that drove. <laughs> so and we had a way to. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then after, um, after he died, I, um, I didn't drive. So I was taking three buses to go see my mom with the kids. And, and Janie would always get so Throw up. sick on the bus. <laughs> <laughs> so I says, oh, Janie, <laughs> this happens. So I says, oh, I have to, I better learn how to drive. I That's better learn right. how to drive. Learned how to drive. So I, I went and took driver's lessons. And, um, and what happened is I told the guy, you have to take me on the highway, take me over the Varisano Bridge, and you have to teach me how to drive in Brooklyn. <laughs> so he did. He did. He was very good. I had double lessons at a time, and I took my uh, driving test in a snowstorm. Oh, my goodness. And I passed. So God was looking out for me there. So from that day on, I was driving, right? Here comes Mom. Be careful. <laughs> <laughs> Did you have the top up when you took your driver's test? No, I didn't. <laughs> she had a red Dodge Dart swinger. <laughs> no, no. <laughs> no comparable. No, 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 no. no comparable. The, the horn was on the handles. Like so when the, I got tense, she boot, said, I love this. <laughs> I could just squeeze the handles and it just honks the horn. <laughs> yeah. So I, I can't leave you out of the big smile. So we talked about the ball peen hammer. We talked about you know driving in the home, in the back of the car, which I remember vividly. What's you know, and you shared a whole bunch of smiles with us today. What's what's your big smile? My you know? big smile is just being in love with him and having his children. As I said, that's the best gift I ever got, and I always smiled. We never fought. We never argued. We never had a fight in the house or anything like that. We were just a really close, loving family. And, and that was my happiness. That was his happiness. So that was my joy. You might want to say that was my everything. Yeah, that, that's really tremendous because the, 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 the amount of pain and suffering and heartbreak that you went through um, to not have your family torn apart, I think is a testament to not only his love, but your love for each other. And I think the, you know, the, the lesson that you have for others is you pull together rather than pull apart. Yeah. If I could be so bold. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. it, was, it was very hard for us um, at the time. You know, we were scared and we, we, we just didn't want to lose anybody, you know, and we were scared going to sleep that we were going to, like, you know, I, I wasn't going to see my mom again. And um, 
but you, you were like the best mom. I can remember my mom saying the right words to me, you know, my sister, and she would say, good night, I love you, and I will see you tomorrow. Mm -hmm. I slept in the room with the girls. In a uh, they had the twin beds and I slept in the cot because they were afraid that I was not going to be there when they wake up in the morning. So that's how I would sleep uh, all the time, mm -hmm. in the room with them in a cot, uh, yeah, mm -hmm. for a while, yeah. So we got past what we had to get past, yeah. Mm -hmm. I want to thank you so far for, for sharing so much uh, about your husband, about your dad about uh, a member of the New York City Fire Department. I think, yeah. I think it's a nice um, way to kind of transition to w what would the you of today tell the you of then? So if you think back, how would you, uh, Jane, you were 26, Janie, you were four, Isabel, you were five. Even through some of your decades, how would you, how would you tell, what would you tell the you of then, what would you tell the 26-year-old Jane Puccia? It takes time. Uh, you need to uh, grieve, cry as much as you need to. Don't hold it in. Talk about your loss. Uh, if somebody else doesn't want to listen, you'll find somebody who will listen. Uh, stay close to your faith and in God. Uh, talk to your husband. Talk to your wife. They're there. Uh, I, I, for one, didn't let him die uh, because he is... As far as I'm concerned, I will see him again, and he's still alive. Uh, so I, uh, I would tell him each day, just take, don't look down the road. Just work with the day that you're working with. But if you have children, make sure you stay close to your children. Make sure you instill in them that after you're gone, that they should still be close. And... Uh, I would say that would be the what I would say. Uh, each day is a struggle. Uh, some are worse than others. Uh, and I'm 52 years uh, without my husband, and uh, I still sometimes, on our anniversary, take out my wedding album, and I look at it, and I feel like I'm in that day. So... Um, there's always a way of you drawing closer to your husband or your deceased one, whoever leaves you. Great. Because they don't really leave you. They are with you. True. Isabel? Thank you. I, um, I would tell um, a five-year-old um, that your dad's still here. You can talk to him. And you'll be able to talk to him the rest of your life. And... Um, and um, he knows that he, he's, he's watching you. He's watching over you. So um, I always would look up to the sky and say, I know you hear me right now. I know you see me doing this, or I know you see me doing that. And um, so he was still um, a presence, uh, he, and he'll still be there for you. Um, you can talk to him. Yeah. Thank you. Jane? Basically, um, I don't know, I, 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 a four-year-old, I would say that your, your dad is always going to be with you. You might not always see him, but he's always going to be there to talk to, to cry with. Um, and it's okay to cry because I... I used to have to go upstairs and cry <laughs> because it was, <laughs> but it's okay to cry. It's okay to talk about your dad. You don't have to just not say anything. 
Um, and I actually, it's probably a, a great segue into me asking you about Ed Ireland. Ed Ireland's here, he's gonna be in the next section, and he's been in your life for a long time. It's a long time. Actually, Ed, they used to travel back and forth to the firehouse together, uh, you know, and Proby School, because uh, Ed lived in Brooklyn at that time, and then uh, they would travel back and forth, and actually Carmine uh, was replacing Ed that night. He relieved Ed that night. So Ed got a phone call, I guess, at, uh, when he was driving home that a firefighter died in that house. And he turned around and went back right to the house. Yeah. Actually, Ed Island was the first ones uh, at Christmas, uh, bought them each a bike. Yeah, we used to get these bikes. <laughs> they used to magically appear, and it wasn't until we went to the, the Centennial um, and we saw Ed Island that he told us. He says, that I, those bikes, bikes were, were from me. us, from me. You know, and <laughs> I just thought, like, they were just coming from the heaven, the sky. Like, Daddy was bringing these bikes down. Like, I mean, like, yeah, every year I got a bike, you know, from, and then it was, we found out that it was Ed that was buying us the bikes for a while. And sure, and I had to teach him how to ride it. <laughs> that wasn't fun. <laughs> so, so Ed's been around for, for the whole time? I mean, we've been in, well, we lost touch with him. Lost touch with him, I, as you said, but we did touch base with him on at the Centennial. And then also when they had the 50th, uh, um, Janie had called up the firehouse and said, are you going to be doing anything for my dad? My dad is 50 years deceased. Uh, and then they put this big thing together at Engine 53 and Ladder 43 for us, which was a, which was a really... Yeah, they were very accommodating. They, they were like, can, can we would that, love man? to... About the plaque dedication? The, the plaque, ded yeah. they rededicated the plaque again to my, my husband. And Isabel was there with her husband and Janie was there. Of course, Isabel's children didn't come because they're in different states. And Janie and my three grandchildren, uh, Janie's three children were there. And uh, they did a beautiful dedication for us. They, they, we felt like royalty. Yeah. <laughs> and that's, we don't usually feel but like But it royalty. was, it was funny because they had said like, oh, you know, we don't, we, 50 years, that's a long time. We haven't, we haven't done a 50 years. You know, they have they to, they have haven't. It. That house, they, they were like, we have to be honest with you. It's the first time we've ever done it. And we're very happy that you reached out to us. Um, as, as you pointed out to them that the 50th anniversary was coming up, we, we do get a sense sometimes that the plaques and the things that are up on the wall become part of the background. And as you move further and further away, with the cycle of firefighters that have been through there, get to a point where they didn't know Carmine. They didn't know the people that knew Carmine. And it, it, you do tend not to forget, but it's not in the forefront of your mind either. And it, it's, it's a poignant reminder that, yeah, there's, there's some things that, that they need to said be it too. They jostled. said, we walk past this plaque every day, but now, now we will walk means, past this differently because we all got up and we said, you know, what we had to say. And, you know, Isabel said her ashtray story and, and I said my, you know, red light, green light story. And, um, you know, I, I, that story I, I tell to a m millions of people, like my coworkers, I, I'm, that's like my go-to story because... I think it really just shows the character of my dad. And and then who knew that as I got older that there was another light. There was a blue light now. It wasn't just red. It wasn't green. It wasn't just yellow. There was a blue light in my dictionary now. And that's because of my dad. Because of my dad that we have that blue light. And there's been, you know, changes provisions made for sometimes you didn't think that you know that is he really a hero was he really a hero like Isabel would say mom he got hit by a train he didn't really save anybody but he did he did he was the only firefighter that was ever killed on a train station mm -hmm. on the tracks 
And from the moment he, he gave up his life, he saved past, present, and future firefighters. And that's what he did. He saved his brothers. Mm -hmm. Yeah. In my eyes, and, and I know that this, this building and everybody that comes through that, this building you know, recognizes that. You know? We all uh, try, John, uh, to uh, explain, to find a dictionary definition of what a hero is. Mm -hmm. And it's not something that you can easily shape. But when you step out and you look at the bigger picture, you can, you can see what, what a hero is. Did somebody make a difference in somebody else's life? Did somebody else save somebody else's life? You know, was, was <clears throat> somebody's yeah, death in vain, you know? You know, at current times, we look at September 11th, you know, like, why, why, why? And there are many changes that happened to the New York City Fire Department, to the whole country, you know, based on you know, tragedy. And your dad, your husband, in my eyes, and I know the people that are in this room, you know, and people that are outside, they're gonna be coming through this building, recognize your dad as a hero and your husband as a hero. Because he is. He is. He is. He is. He is. He is. So, you know, you know, keep that, that love. Because he did, He's, yeah. he saved his brothers from, yeah. no one ever lost their life. Right. Because the power was. Red light, green light, blue light. Now, I'm going to keep that with me, if, you know, for, for always, you know. Wasn't there when my dad was working. It wasn't there. Yeah. So I think everything that we've talked about in this last two minutes is, is going to bring us to this building, the building that we're, we're sitting in right now. All right. This beautiful uh, building. This beautiful <laughs> building. It's Thank off you. The so there, there, there was um, some gentleman that we're going to talk to later that had a vision, that had a vision to recognize your family, to recognize your dad and your husband. And there was, there was no stopping them. There was no stopping You saw that earlier when you were here, uh, and they made this beautiful, beautiful, beautiful building. So um, talk about your thoughts about the people that put this together, the building together. Even the people that, that called you up and said, hey, we're gonna do a podcast. Talk about what, what that means to you as a family and as individuals. What does that, what does that mean to you that when you walk in this building, you know, your dad and your husband's alive here. He is. Very much alive. You, you could feel the presence. You can feel him in here. And uh, you could see it everywhere. And the people that worked on this building, you could see the labor of love that they put into it. It wasn't just put together every corner, every inch of it. Uh, the day that we walked into the, into the ceremony, uh, the big Piper plane at the end of, uh, of, of the tunnel was like, felt like 50 big Pipers were playing and it was only the one. And the uh, green beret that wore his Navy uniform that stood on the corner of the platform so straight, I didn't even know it was a person there. <laughs> I mean, it was like, and, and he said to Brendan that he wouldn't wear his uh, Navy uniform for, uh, his, for anyone, but he wore it for Carmine. So it was just a beautiful thing. I mean, to see his pictures on the wall, to, uh, uh, as I said, he's just, it's just the whole building. I just, there's nothing I don't, like about the building. It's just <laughs> breathtaking. I want to come over here all the time, but the traffic is not good. <laughs> <laughs> and the experience of actually walking down on the tracks when we first saw the, the, um, the, the station. Um, I, I can remember when I was in the city at the subway stations, always looking down at the tracks and knowing that my dad was down on the tracks and and he lost his life there and when when we actually walked down onto the tracks and then saw his name you know in the graffiti the impact of that was just it was it it, it just floored me it, it was just amazing just to to actually experience being on that down on the tracks and seeing his name there. And it, it really memorialized him.
as if my dad was unforgettable before, it's like now no one will ever forget him. And um, this building, just it's just so unique because, but I, yeah. it, you know, the subway unit, the whole subway unit, and Brendan Connolly <laughs> just took the time to really get to know who my dad was, what he did, and what he sacrificed. And just, it just was so much love. Like every little tile that they put into this building was out of love. And it, it shows, and just, my dad is here because we feel him. Yeah. And it just, it wasn't just, you know, a memorial, you know, for my dad, just slapping things together. I mean, it just, it was just the pictures, you know, that, that say that, you know, family is everything, you know, and every little detail and the, the love that they put into this building to make it so off the charts. And Well, we can't thank the fire department enough and uh, Brendan and uh, the subway unit for, for this. We, uh, I would have never ever thought that I would have a building like this named after him, never. And to be still alive <laughs> and to be able to come and walk through it is a gift. It's a gift. Eternally grateful for this. That's a, a great, you know, walk in to my next question. And then I'm going to punt over to John. Um, what's your impression of the FDNY, the New York City Fire Department of today? I mean, I, I think the... The subway unit, the whole crew, I, I think that speaks of, about who the New York City Fire Department is. But what's your impression of the, the current New York City Fire Department? I think they're number one. Okay. I ha can't help but say that. They are number one. <laughs> I'm not going to say I think. They, they are number one. <laughs> I Everything New York is, is number, number one, one for my mom. For my mom. <laughs> <laughs> they, my grandson said, you're a true New Yorker, Nan. Uh, you bet. <laughs> but they are number one, and I, I love them, and I, I think they are, now they share so much of brotherly love with each other. And, uh, and they, they're, they're a group of men and women now that would be more than happy to go the extra yard to help anybody. That's just my impression. I, 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 I really love the fire department. The good cooks. Good cooks. <laughs> yeah, Brendan. Yeah. <laughs> We've had a few good meals. <laughs> That's right. They are good cooks. <laughs> so me being a, a retired you know, member of the, the fire department, I, I think everything that your, your dad and your husband represents lives with us. I, I really do. You know, if it's um, something that I, when I was working, would bring to me every day is empathy and, and compassion for, for others and, and trying to, to give back to somebody, to somebody that I didn't know. Um, the story, you know, about your dad stopping and everybody honking horns. He didn't care. That's, that's who the FDNY is. Yes. That's who the FDNY is. Yeah. So, and I can see it in your face as we're talking, the, the glow is about, yeah, yeah, that's my dad, and that is the FDNY. Yeah, and that's love, and, and they that's, have a lot of love. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> they have a lot of love. So um, I'm going to switch over to um, nationally. You know, we all say we never forget, and sometimes there, there's there is there's a gap, and it's out of our control. Um, but we we nationally at the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation, mm -hmm. uh, we recognize that. Mr. Um, so John, if you would explain the BRIC program to us. Sure. Uh, the, when the National Memorial was created, <clears throat> it was 1981, it was dedicated in 82. And over the years, other family members had come forward and said, well, what about our, our family member uh, that died prior to that? How do we recognize them? Um, th so the foundation uh, created a walk of honor on the grounds of the National Fire Academy. And uh, on, uh, on that walkway are the are bricks that are dedicated to the firefighters that died before the National Memorial was created. And um, there is a node uh, on the walkway for FDNY firefighters that died before 1981. And Carmine has a brick there. 
uh, that was purchased by Vina Drennan, um, the widow of an, another New York City firefighter that died in the line of duty. So even though um, uh, we, we can't get every name on the plaque of the National Memorial, we felt it was fitting to put all of the other firefighters, there's over 8,000 names of firefighters that died prior to the National Memorial being dedicated that are recognized and remembered there. And um, we have a photograph of the brick uh, to provide you. And then once the weather clears up, because it's just as nasty in Emmitsburg, Maryland today as it is <laughs> in New York, um, we will get a rubbing done of the brick and, and send it to you oh. as, a, as a memory. Um, because this is a project that was really at the heart of one of our uh, former uh, chairs of, of the board. He wanted every other firefighter that couldn't be named on the memorial to have recognition. So he made it, a, he made it an effort on his part to get all of the states and fire departments to send the names in and sponsor bricks for the firefighters that died prior to the memorial being created. Beautiful. So, it's, um, so we, uh, we, we did get a photo of them. Um, you know, we're, we're, uh, we're, I think we're at a pretty good point here uh, to express our, our deepest gratitude for your courage and candor to come forward and, and share your intimate knowledge and memories of your dad and your husband, um, who sounds like a man that we should all model ourselves after. And I, I think that what we hope to accomplish here will be accomplished when other firefighters and family members listen to the podcast or watch the podcast or look at the extra material, they'll get a sense of what it means to be a firefighter, which means to serve, um, serve others, not yourself. Uh, it means that uh, family members don't ever forget and we shouldn't forget either. And even though it may have taken 50 years, the, a, a group of men and women of the New York City Fire Department came together because they were inspired by what they learned and what they, what they looked at in their history and decided to make a fitting tribute to a sacrifice so that every other firefighter that walks in here has a human connection to this training facility. Because you can't learn better than by knowing another human being was part and parcel of this process. So uh, on behalf of the foundation, I can't, can't thank you enough for bringing Carmine to life for us. Um, I know there's been a lot of tears, but I hope there's been some smiles. I oh, hope there's yeah. been some happy memories. I'm so memories. glad that he's really finally recognized for what he did because it was big. It was huge. On our part. As because like, he was, it was huge for his brothers. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Although he didn't save a person in the fire or, you know, he did save his. The lives he he's, has saved since, um, I, I think, hopefully give you some comfort in whatever small way that can be. But if you think about that in the thousands of firefighters that have been through training, um, I, I think, I, I hope that that provides you with a little bit of solace and maybe brings a little bit of a brighter smile yes. <laughs> for, for, what, for what you have had to give to, to the world. So oh, we'd like to express our deepest gratitude to the Puccia family. And uh, on behalf of my colleague, Joe Minogue, we want to say thank you to everyone for joining us. Um, this is John Tippett from the National Fallen Firefighters Foundation. And we hope that you will take this lesson to never forget our fallen. Remember to pick up part two of this podcast featuring Captain Brendan Conley and Lieutenant Brian McNamara of the FDNY Fire Academy Subway and Extrication Unit, accompanied by retired FDNY Captain Ed Ireland, the firefighter Carmine Puccia relieved on that fateful night. <laughs>